Chapter Forty of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty. A strange interview, which is a sequel to the last chamber. The girl's life had been squandered in the streets, and among the most noisome of the stews and dens of London. But there was something of the woman's original nature left in her still. And when she heard a light step approaching the door opposite to that by which she had entered, and thought of the wide contrast which the small room would in another moment contain, she felt burdened with the sense of her own deep shame, and shrunk as though she could scarcely bear the presence of her with whom she had sought this interview. But struggling with these better feelings was pride, the vice of the lowest and most debased creatures, no less than of the high and self-assured. The miserable companion of thieves and ruffians, the fallen outcast of low haunts, the associate of the scourings of the jails and hulks, living within the shadow of the gallows itself, even this degraded being felt too proud to betray a feeble gleam of the womanly feeling which she thought a weakness, but which alone connected her with that humanity of which her wasting life had obliterated so many, many traces when a very child. She raised her eyes sufficiently to observe that the figure which presented itself was that of a slight and beautiful girl. Then, bending them on the ground, she tossed her head with affected carelessness, as she said, "'It's a hard matter to get to see you, lady. If I had taken offence and gone away, as many would have done, you'd have been sorry for it one day, and not without reason, either.' "'I am very sorry if any one has behaved harshly to you,' replied Rose. "'Do not think of that.' "'Tell me why you wish to see me. I am the person you inquired for.' The kind tone of this answer, the sweet voice, the gentle manner, the absence of any accent of haughtiness or displeasure, took the girl completely by surprise, and she burst into tears. "'Oh, lady, lady,' she said, clasping her hands passionately before her face, "'if there was more like you, there would be fewer like me. There would. There would.' "'Sit down,' said Rose, earnestly. "'If you are in poverty or affliction, I shall be truly glad to relieve you if I can. I shall, indeed. Sit down.' "'Let me stand, lady,' said the girl, still weeping. "'And do not speak to me so kindly till you know me better. It is growing late. Is, is that door shut?' "'Yes,' said Rose, recoiling a few steps, as if to be nearer assistance in case she should require it. "'Why, because,' said the girl, "'I am about to put my life and the lives of others in your hands. I am the girl that dragged little Oliver back to old Fagan's on the night he went out from the house in Pentonville.' "'You?' said Rose Maylie. "'Aye, lady,' replied the girl. "'I am the infamous creature you have heard of that lives among the thieves.' and that never from the first moment i can recollect my eyes and senses opening on london streets have known any better life or kinder words than they have given me so help me god do not mind shrinking openly from me lady i am younger than you would think to look at me but i am well used to it the poorest women fall back as i make my way along the crowded pavement what dreadful things are these said rose involuntarily falling from her strange companion "'Thank heaven, upon your knees, dear lady,' cried the girl, "'that you have friends to care for, and keep you in your childhood, and that you were never in the midst of cold and hunger, and riot and drunkenness, and, and, and something worse than all, as I have been from my cradle. I may use the word, for the alley and the gutter were mine, as they will be my deathbed.' "'I pity you,' said Rose, in a broken voice. "'It wrings my heart to hear you.' "'Heaven bless you for your goodness,' rejoined the girl. "'If you knew what I am sometimes, you would pity me indeed. But I have stolen away from those who would surely murder me if they knew I had been here, to tell you what I have overheard. Do you know a man named Monks?' "'No,' said Rose. "'He knows you,' replied the girl. "'And knew you were here, for it was by hearing him tell the place that I found you out.' "'I never heard the name,' said Rose. "'Then he goes by some other amongst us,' 
rejoined the girl, which I more than thought before. Some time ago, and soon after Oliver was put into your house on the night of the robbery, I, suspecting this man, listened to a conversation held between him and Fagin in the dark. I found out, from what I heard, that Monks, the man I asked you about, you know— Yes, said Rose, I understand. That Monks, pursued the girl, had seen him accidentally with two of our boys on the day we first lost him, and had known him directly to be the same child that he was watching for, though I couldn't make out why. A bargain was struck with Fagin, that if Oliver was got back, he should have a certain sum, and he was to have more for making him a thief, which this monks wanted for some purpose of his own. "'For what purpose?' asked Rose. "'He caught sight of my shadow on the wall as I listened, in the hope of finding out,' said the girl. "'And there are not many people besides me that could have got out of their way in time to escape discovery. But I did, and I saw him no more till last night.' "'And what occurred then?' "'I'll tell you, lady. Last night he came again. Again they went upstairs. And I, wrapping myself up so that my shadow would not betray me, again listened at the door. The first words I heard Monk say were these. So the only proofs of the boy's identity lie at the bottom of the river, and the old hag that received them from the mother is rotting in her coffin. They laughed and talked of his success in doing this, and Monks, talking on about the boy, and getting very wild, said that though he had got the young devil's money safely now, he'd rather have had it the other way, for what a game it would have been to have brought down the boast of the father's will by driving him through every jail in town, and then hauling him up for some capital felony which Fagin could easily manage, after having made a good profit of him besides. "'What?' is all this said rose the truth lady though it comes from my lips replied the girl then he said with oaths common enough in my ears but strange to yours that if he could gratify his hatred by taking the boy's life without bringing his own neck in danger he would but as he couldn't he'd be upon the watch to meet him at every turn in life and if he took advantage of his birth and history he might harm him yet. In short, Fagin, he says, Jew as you are, you never laid such snares as I'll contrive for my young brother Oliver. His brother? exclaimed Rose. Those were his words, said Nancy, glancing uneasily round as she had scarcely ceased to do since she began to speak, for a vision of Sykes haunted her perpetually. And more, when he spoke of you, and the other lady, and said it seemed contrived by heaven, or the devil, against him, that Oliver should come into your hands, he laughed, and said there was some comfort in that too, for how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of pounds would you not give, if you had them, to know who your two-legged spaniel was? "'You do not mean,' said Rose, turning very pale, "'to tell me that this was said in earnest?' "'He spoke in hard and angry earnest, if a man ever did,' replied the girl, shaking her head. "'He is an earnest man when his hatred is up. I know many who do worse things, but I rather listen to them all a dozen times, and to that monk's wants. It is growing late, and I have to reach home without suspicion of having been on such an errand as this. I must get back quickly.' "'But what can I do?' said Rose. "'To what use can I turn this communication without you?' back? Why do you wish to return to companions you paint in such terrible colours? If you repeat this information to a gentleman whom I can summon in an instant from the next room, you can be consigned to some place of safety without half an hour's delay." "'I wish to go back,' said the girl. "'I must go back, because—how can I tell such things to an innocent lady like you? Because among the men I have told you of, there is one the most desperate among them all, that I can't leave, no, not even to be saved from the life I am leading now." "'You're having interfered in this dear boy's behalf before,' said Rose. "'You're coming here at so great a risk to tell me what you have heard. Your manner, which convinces me of the truth of what you say, your evident contrition and sense of shame, 
all lead me to believe that you might yet be reclaimed. Oh, said the earnest girl, folding her hands as the tears coursed down her face, do not turn a deaf ear to the entreaties of one of your own sex. The first, the first, I do believe, who have appealed to you in the voice of pity and compassion. Do hear my words, and let me save you yet for better things. Lady, cried the girl, sinking on her knees, dear sweet angel lady, you are the first that ever blessed me with such words as these, and if I had heard them years ago, they might have turned me from a life of sin and sorrow. But it's too late. It is too late. It is never too late, said Rose, for penitence and atonement. It is, cried the girl, writhing in agony of her mind. I cannot leave him now. I could not be his death. Why should you be? asked Rose. Nothing could save him, cried the girl. If I told others what I have told you, and led to their being taken, he would be sure to die. He is the boldest, and has been so cruel. Is it possible, cried Rose, that for such a man as this you can resign every future hope, and the certainty of immediate rescue? It is madness. I don't know what it is, answered the girl. I only know that it is so, and not with me alone, but with hundreds of others as bad and wretched as myself. I must go back. Whether it is God's wrath for the wrong I have done, I do not know, but I am drawn back to him through every suffering and ill usage, and I should be, I believe, if I knew that I was to die by his hand at last. What am I to do? said Rose. I should not let you depart from me thus. You should, lady, and I know you will, rejoined the girl, rising. You will not stop my going, because I have trusted in your goodness, and forced no promise from you, as I might have done. Of what use, then, is the communication you have made? said Rose. This mystery must be investigated, or how will its disclosure to me benefit Oliver, whom you are anxious to serve? You must have some kind gentleman about you, that will hear it as a secret, and advise you what to do," rejoined the girl. "'But where can I find you again when it is necessary?' asked Rose. "'I do not seek to know where these dreadful people live. But where will you be walking or passing, at any settled period from this time?' "'Will you promise me that you will have my secret strictly kept, and come alone, or with the only other person that knows it?' and that I shall not be watched or followed?" asked the girl. "'I promise you solemnly,' answered Rose. "'Every Sunday night, from eleven until the clock strikes twelve, said the girl, without hesitation, I will walk on London Bridge, if I am alive. "'Stay another moment,' interposed Rose, as the girl moved hurriedly towards the door. "'Think once again on your own condition, and the opportunity you have of escaping from it. You have a claim on me, not only as a voluntary bearer of this intelligence, but as a woman lost almost beyond redemption. Will you return to this gang of robbers, and to this man, when a word can save you? What fascination is it that can take you back, and make you cling to wickedness and misery? Oh! Is there no chord in your heart that I can touch? Is there nothing left to which I can appeal against this terrible infatuation? "'When ladies as young and good and beautiful as you are,' replied the girl steadily, "'give away your hearts. Love will carry you all lengths, even such as you, who have home, friends, other admirers, everything to fill them. When such as I, who have no certain roof but the coffin lid, and no friend in sickness or death but the hospital nurse, set our rotten hearts on any man.' and let me fill the place that has been a blank through all our wretched lives. Who can hope to cure us? Pity us, lady, pity us for having only one feeling of the woman left, and for having that turned, by every judgment, from a comfort and a pride, into a new means of violence and suffering. You will, said Rose, after a pause, take some money from me, which may enable you to live without dishonesty at all events until we meet again. Not a penny, 
replied the girl, waving her hand. "'Do not close your heart against all my efforts to help you,' said Rose, stepping gently forward. "'I wish to serve you, indeed.' "'You would serve me best, lady,' replied the girl, wringing her hands, "'if you could take my life at once. For I have felt more grief to think of what I am to-night than I ever did before, and it would be something not to die in the hell in which I have lived. God bless you, sweet lady, and send as much happiness on your head as I have brought shame on mine." Thus speaking, and sobbing aloud, the unhappy creature turned away, while Rose Maylie, overpowered by this extraordinary interview, which had more the semblance of a rapid dream than an actual occurrence, sank into a chair and endeavoured to collect her wandering thoughts. End of chapter 40「Forty One of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Forty One. Containing fresh discoveries, and showing that surprises, like misfortunes, seldom come alone. Her situation was, indeed, one of no common trial and difficulty while she felt a most eager and burning desire to penetrate the mystery in which Oliver's history was enveloped, she could not but hold sacred the confidence which the miserable woman with whom she had just conversed had reposed in her, as a young and guileless girl. Her words and manner had touched Rose Maylie's heart, and, mingled with her love for her young charge, and scarcely less intense in its truth and fervour, was her fond wish to win the outcast back to repentance and hope. They purposed remaining in London only three days, prior to departing for some weeks to a distant part of the coast. It was now midnight of the first day. What course of action could she determine upon, which could be adopted in eight and forty hours? Or how could she postpone the journey without exciting suspicion? Mr. Losburn was with them, and would be for the next two days, but Rose was too well acquainted with the excellent gentleman's impetuosity and foresaw too clearly the wrath with which, in the first explosion of his indignation, he would regard the instrument of Oliver's recapture, to trust him with the secret, when her representations in the girl's behalf could be seconded by no experienced person. These were all reasons for the greatest caution, and most circumspect behaviour in communicating it to Mrs. Maylie, whose first impulse would infallibly be to hold a conference with the worthy doctor on the subject. As to resorting to any legal adviser, even if she had known how to do so, it was scarcely to be thought of for the same reason. Once the thought occurred to her of seeking assistance from Harry, but this awakened the recollection of their last parting, and it seemed unworthy of her to call him back when the tears rose to her eyes as she pursued this train of reflection. He might have by this time learnt to forget her, and to be happier away. Disturbed by these different reflections, inclining now to one course and then to another, and again recoiling from all, as each successive consideration presented itself to her mind, Rose passed a sleepless and anxious night. After more communing with herself next day, she arrived at the desperate conclusion of consulting Harry. "'If it be painful to him,' she thought, "'to come back here, how painful it will be to me. But perhaps he will not come. He may write, or he may come himself, and studiously abstain from meeting me. He did when he went away. I hardly thought he would, but it was better for us both." And here Rose dropped the pen, and turned away, as though the very paper which was to be her messenger should not see her weep. She had taken up the same pen, and laid it down again fifty times, and had considered and reconsidered the first line of her letter without writing the first word, when Oliver, who had been walking in the streets with Mr. Giles for a bodyguard, entered the room in such breathless haste and violent agitation as seemed to betoken some new cause of alarm. "'What makes you look so flurried?' asked Rose, advancing to meet him. "'I hardly know how. I feel as if I should be choked,' replied the boy. "'Oh, dear! To think that I should see him at last, and you should be able to know that I have told you the truth!' "'I never thought you had told us anything but the truth,' said Rose, soothing him. 
but what is this? Of whom do you speak? I have seen the gentleman, replied Oliver, scarcely able to articulate. The gentleman who was so good to me, Mr. Brownlow, that we have so often talked about. Where? asked Rose. Get it out of a coach, replied Oliver, shedding tears of delight, and going into a house. I didn't speak to him. I couldn't speak to him, for he didn't see me, and I trembled so that I was not able to go up to him. But Giles asked, for me, whether he lived there, and they said he did. Look here, said Oliver, opening a scrap of paper. Here it is. Here's where he lives. I'm going there directly. Oh, dear me, dear me, what shall I do when I come to see him and hear him speak again? With her attention not a little distracted by these, and a great many other incoherent exclamations of joy, Rose read the address, which was Craven Street, in the Strand. She very soon determined upon turning the discovery to account. "'Quick,' she said, "'tell them to fetch a hackney coach, and be ready to go with me. I will take you there directly, without a minute's loss of time. I will only tell my aunt that we are going out for an hour, and be ready as soon as you are.' Oliver needed no prompting to dispatch, and in little more than five minutes they were on their way to Craven Street. When they arrived there, Rose left Oliver in the coach, under pretence of preparing the old gentleman to receive him, and sending up her card by the servant, requested to see Mr. Brownlow on very pressing business. The servant soon returned, to beg that she would walk upstairs, and following him into an upper room, Miss Maylie was presented to an elderly gentleman of benevolent appearance, in a bottle-green coat. At no great distance from whom was seated another old gentleman, in nankeen breeches and gaiters, who did not look particularly benevolent, and who was sitting with his hands clasped on the top of a thick stick, and his chin propped thereupon. "'Dear me!' said the gentleman in the bottle-green coat, hastily rising with great politeness. I beg your pardon, young lady. I imagined it was some importunate person who—I beg you will excuse me. Be seated, pray." "'Mr. Brownlow, I believe, sir,' said Rose, glancing from the other gentleman to the one who had spoken. "'That is my name,' said the old gentleman. "'This is my friend Mr. Grimwig. Grimwig, will you leave us for a few minutes?' "'I believe,' interposed Miss Maylie, that at this period of our interview I need not give that gentleman the trouble of going away. If I am correctly informed, he is cognizant of the business on which I wish to speak to you." Mr. Brownlow inclined his head. Mr. Grimwig, who had made one very stiff bow, and risen from his chair, made another very stiff bow, and dropped into it again. "'I shall surprise you very much, I have no doubt,' said Rose, naturally embarrassed. But you once showed great benevolence and goodness to a very dear young friend of mine, and I am sure you will take an interest in hearing of him again." "'Indeed?' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Oliver Twist, you knew him as,' replied Rose. The words no sooner escaped her lips, than Mr. Grimwig, who had been affecting to dip into a large book that lay on the table, upset it with a great crash, and falling back in his chair, discharged from his features every expression but one of unmitigated wonder and indulged in a prolonged and vacant stare. Then, as if ashamed of having betrayed so much emotion, he jerked himself, as it were, by a convulsion, into his former attitude, and looking out straight before him, emitted a long, deep whistle, which seemed, at last, not to be discharged on empty air, but to die away in the innermost recesses of his stomach. Mr. Brownlow was no less surprised, although his astonishment was not expressed in the same eccentric manner. He drew his chair nearer to Miss Maylie's, and said, "'Do me the favour, my dear young lady, to leave entirely out of the question that goodness and benevolence of which you speak, and of which nobody else knows anything. And if you have it in your power to produce any evidence which will alter the unfavourable opinion I was once induced to entertain of that poor child, in heaven's name put me in possession of it.' "'A bad one. I'll eat my head if he's not a bad one,' growled Mr. Grimwig, speaking by some ventriloquial power, without moving a muscle of his face. "'He is a child of a noble nature and a warm heart,' said Rose, colouring, "'and that power, 
which has thought fit to try him beyond his years, has planted in his breast affections and feelings which would do honour to many who have numbered his days six times over. "'I'm only sixty-one, said Mr. Grimwig, with the same rigid face, and as the devil's in it, if this Oliver is not twelve years old at least, I don't see the application of that remark. "'Do not heed my friend, Miss Maylie,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'He does not mean what he says. Yes, he does,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'No, he doesn't,' said Mr. Brownlow, obviously rising in wrath as he spoke. "'He'll eat his head if he doesn't,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'He would deserve to have it knocked off if he does,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'And he'd uncommonly like to see any man offer to do it,' responded Mr. Grimwig, knocking his stick upon the floor. Having gone thus far, the two old gentlemen severally took snuff, and afterwards shook hands, according to their invariable custom. "'Now, Miss Maylie,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'to return to the subject in which your humanity is so much interested, will you let me know what intelligence you have of this poor child, allowing me to promise that I exhausted every means in my power of discovering him, and that since I have been absent from this country, my first impression that he had imposed upon me, and had been persuaded by his former associates to rob me, has been considerably shaken." Rose, who had had time to collect her thoughts, at once related, in a few natural words, all that had befallen Oliver since he left Mr. Brownlow's house, reserving Nancy's information for that gentleman's private ear, and concluding with the assurance that his only sorrow, for some months past, had been not being able to meet with his former benefactor and friend. "'Thank God!' said the old gentleman. "'This is great happiness to me, great happiness. But you have not told me where he is now, Miss Maylie. You must pardon my finding fault with you, but why not have brought him?' "'He is waiting in the coach at the door,' replied Rose. "'At this door?' cried the old gentleman with which he hurried out of the room, down the stairs, up the coach steps, and into the coach, without another word. When the room door closed behind him, Mr. Grimwig lifted up his head, and converting one of the hind legs of his chair into a pivot, described three distinct circles, with the assistance of his stick, and the table, sitting in it all the time. After performing this evolution, he rose and limped as fast as he could, up and down the room, at least a dozen times and then stopping suddenly before Rose, kissed her without the slightest preface. "'Shh!' he said, as the young lady rose in some alarm at this unusual proceeding. "'Don't be afraid. I'm old enough to be your grandfather. You're a sweet girl. I like you. Here they are.' In fact, as he threw himself at one dexterous dive into his former seat, Mr. Brownlow returned, accompanied by Oliver, whom Mr. Grimwig received very graciously and if the gratification of that moment had been the only reward for all her anxiety and care in Oliver's behalf, Rose Maylie would have been well repaid. "'There is somebody else who should not be forgotten, by the by,' said Mr. Brownlow, ringing the bell. "'Send Mrs. Bedwin here, if you please.' The old housekeeper answered the summons with all dispatch, and dropping a curtsey at the door, waited for orders. "'Why, you get blinder every day, Bedwin!' said Mr. Brownlow, rather testily. "'Well, that I do, sir,' replied the old lady. "'People's eyes at my time of life don't improve with age, sir.' "'I could have told you that,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow. "'But put on your glasses, and see if you can't find out what you were wanted for, will you?' The old lady began to rummage in her pocket for her spectacles, but Oliver's patience was not proof against this new trial, and yielding to his first impulse, he sprang into her arms. "'God be good to me!' cried the old lady, embracing him. "'It is my innocent boy!' "'My dear old nurse!' cried Oliver. "'He would come back. I knew he would,' said the old lady, holding him in her arms. "'How well he looks! And how like a gentleman's son he is dressed again! Where have you been this long, long while? Ah! The same sweet face, but not so pale! the same soft eye, but not so sad. I have never forgotten them, or his quiet smile, but have seen them every day, side by side with those of my own dear children, 
dead and gone since I was a lightsome young creature. Running on thus, and now holding Oliver from her to mark how he had grown, now clasping him to her, and passing her fingers fondly through his hair, the good soul laughed and wept upon his neck by turns. Leaving her and Oliver to compare notes at leisure, Mr. Brownlow led the way into another room, and there heard from Rose a full narration of her interview with Nancy, which occasioned him no little surprise and perplexity. Rose also explained her reasons for not confiding in her friend Mr. Losburn in the first instance. The old gentleman considered that she had acted prudently, and readily undertook to hold solemn conference with the worthy doctor himself. To afford him an early opportunity for the execution of this design, it was arranged that he should call at the hotel at eight o'clock that evening, and that in the meantime Mrs. Maylie should be cautiously informed of all that had occurred. These preliminaries adjusted, Rose and Oliver returned home. Rose had by no means overrated the measure of the good doctor's wrath. Nancy's history was no sooner unfolded to him than he poured forth a shower of mingled threats and execrations, threatened to make her the first victim of the combined ingenuity of Messrs. Blathers and Duff, and actually put on his hat preparatory to sallying forth to obtain the assistance of those worthies. And doubtless he would, in this first outbreak, have carried the intention into effect without a moment's consideration of the consequences, if he had not been restrained, in part, by corresponding violence on the side of Mr. Brownlow, who was himself an irascible temperament, and party by such arguments and representations as seemed best calculated to dissuade him from his hot-brained purpose. "'Then what the devil is to be done?' said the impetuous doctor, when they had rejoined the two ladies. "'Are we to pass a vote of thanks to all these vagabonds, male and female, and beg them to accept a hundred pounds or so apiece as a trifling mark of our esteem, and some slight acknowledgment of their kindness to Oliver?' "'Not exactly that.' rejoined Mr. Brownlow, laughing. "'But we must proceed gently and with great care.' "'Gentleness and care!' exclaimed the doctor. "'I'd send them one and all to—' "'Never mind where,' interposed Mr. Brownlow. "'But reflect whether sending them anywhere is likely to attain the object we have in view.' "'What object?' asked the doctor. "'Simply the discovery of Oliver's parentage.' and regaining for him the inheritance of which, if this story be true, he has been fraudulently deprived. Ah," said Mr. Losburn, cooling himself with his pocket-handkerchief, "'I almost forgot that. You see,' pursued Mr. Brownlow, "'placing this poor girl entirely out of the question, and supposing it were possible to bring these scoundrels to justice without compromising her safety, what good should we bring about?' "'Hanging a few of them at least in all probability,' suggested the doctor, "'and transporting the rest.' "'Very good,' replied Mr. Brownlow, smiling. "'But no doubt they will bring that about for themselves in the fullness of time. And if we step in to forestall them, it seems to me that we shall be performing a very quixotic act in direct opposition to our own interest, or at least to Oliver's which is the same thing. How? inquired the doctor. Thus. It is quite clear that we shall have extreme difficulty in getting to the bottom of this mystery, unless we can bring this man, Monks, upon his knees. That can only be done by stratagem, and by catching him when he is not surrounded by these people. For, suppose he were apprehended, we have no proof against him. He is not even, so far as we know, or as the facts appear to us, concerned with the gang in any of their robberies. If he were not discharged, it is very unlikely that he could receive any further punishment than being committed to prison as a rogue and vagabond, and, of course, ever afterwards his mouth would be so obstinately closed that he might as well, for our purposes, be deaf, dumb, blind, and an idiot. Then— said the doctor impetuously, "'I'll put it to you again. Whether you think it reasonable, that this promise to the girl should be considered binding, a promise made with the best and kindest intentions, but really do not discuss the point, my dear young lady, pray,' said Mr. Brownlow, interrupting Rose as she was about to speak. "'The promise shall be kept. 
I don't think it will, in the slightest degree, interfere with our proceedings. But before we can resolve upon any precise course of action, it will be necessary to see the girl, to ascertain from her whether she will point out this Monks, on the understanding that he is to be dealt with by us, and not by the law, or, if she will not, or cannot do that, to procure from her such an account of his haunts and descriptions of his person, as will enable us to identify him. She cannot be seen until next Sunday night. This is Tuesday. I would suggest that in the meantime we remain perfectly quiet, and keep these matters secret, even from Oliver himself." Although Mr. Losburn received with many wry faces a proposal involving a delay of five whole days, he was fain to admit that no better course occurred to him just then. And as both Rose and Mrs. Maylie sided very strongly with Mr. Brownlow, that gentleman's proposition was carried unanimously. "'I should like,' he said, "'to call in the aid of my friend Grimwig. He is a strange creature, but a shrewd one, and might prove of material assistance to us. I should say that he was bred a lawyer, and quitted the bar in disgust, because he had only one brief, and a motion, of course, in twenty years. Though whether that is recommendation or not, you must determine for yourselves. "'I have no objection to your calling in your friend, if I may call in mine,' said the doctor. "'We must put it to the vote,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'Who may he be?' "'That lady's son, and this young lady's very old friend,' said the doctor, motioning towards Mrs. Maylie and concluding with an expressive glance at her niece. Rose blushed deeply, but she did not make any audible objection to this motion. Possibly she felt in a hopeless minority. And Harry Maylie and Mr. Grimwig were accordingly added to the committee. "'We stay in town, of course,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'while there remains the slightest prospect of prosecuting this inquiry with a chance of success.' I will spare neither trouble nor expense in behalf of the object in which we are all so deeply interested, and I am content to remain here, if it be for twelve months, so long as you assure me that any hope remains." "'Good,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow, "'and as I see on the faces about me a disposition to inquire how it happened that I was not in the way to corroborate Oliver's tale, and had so suddenly left the kingdom, let me stipulate that I shall be asked no questions, until of such time as I may deem it expedient to forestall them by telling my own story. Believe me, I make this request with good reason, for I might otherwise excite hopes destined never to be realised, and only increase difficulties and disappointments, already quite numerous enough. Come, supper has been announced, and young Oliver, who is all alone in the next room, will have begun to think by this time that we have wearied of his company, and entered into some dark conspiracy to thrust him forth upon the world." With these words, the old gentleman gave his hand to Mrs. Maylie, and escorted her into the supper-room. Mr. Losburn followed, leading Rose, and the council was, for the present, effectually broken up. End of chapter 41 Chapter forty two of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter forty two. An old acquaintance of Oliver's, exhibiting decided marks of genius, becomes a public character in the metropolis. Upon the night when Nancy, having lulled Mr. Sykes to sleep, hurried on her self imposed mission to Rose Maylie, there advanced towards London, by the Great North Road, two persons upon whom it is expedient that this history should bestow some attention. They were a man and woman, or perhaps they would be better described as a male and female, for the former was one of those long-limbed, knock-kneed, shambling, bony people, to whom it is difficult to assign any precise age, looking as they do, when they are yet boys, like undergrown men and when they are almost men, like overgrown boys. The woman was young, but of a robust and hardy make, as she need have been to bear the weight of the heavy bundle which was strapped to her back. 
her companion was not encumbered with much luggage, as they merely dangled from a stick which he carried over his shoulder, a small parcel wrapped in a common handkerchief, and apparently light enough. This circumstance, added to the length of his legs, which were of unusual extent, enabled him with much ease to keep some half-dozen paces in advance of his companion, to whom he occasionally turned with an impatient jerk of the head, as if reproaching her tardiness and urging her to greater exertion. Thus they had toiled along the dusty road, taking little heed of any object within sight, save when they stepped aside to allow a wider passage for the mail-coaches which were whirling out of town, until they passed through Highgate Archway, when the foremost traveller stopped and called impatiently to his companion, "'Come on, can't you? What a lazy bones you are, Charlotte!' "'It's a heavy load, I can tell you,' said the female, coming up almost breathless with fatigue. "'Heavy? What are you talking about? What are you made for?' rejoined the male traveller, changing his own little bundle as he spoke to the other shoulder. "'Now there you are, resting again. Well, if you ain't enough to tire anybody's patience out, I don't know what is.' "'Is it much farther?' said the woman, resting herself against a bank, and looking up with the perspiration streaming from her face. "'Much farther? You're as good as there,' said the long-legged tramper, pointing out before him. "'Look there! Those are the lights of London.' "'They're a good two mile off, at least,' said the woman despondingly. "'Never mind whether they're two mile off or twenty, said Noah Claypole, for he it was. "'But get up and come on, or I'll kick you, and so I give you notice.' As Noah's red nose grew redder with anger, and as he crossed the road while speaking, as if fully prepared to put his threat into execution, the woman rose without any further remark, and trudged onward by his side. "'Where do you mean to stop for the night, Noah?' she asked, after they had walked a few hundred yards. "'How should I know?' replied Noah, whose temper had been considerably impaired by walking. "'Near, I hope,' said Charlotte. "'No, not near,' replied Mr. Claypole. "'There, not near, so don't think it.' "'Why not?' "'When I tell you that I don't mean to do a thing, that's enough, without any why or because either.' replied Mr. Claypole, with dignity. "'Well, you needn't be so cross,' said his companion. "'A pretty thing it would be, wouldn't it, to go and stop at the very first public house outside the town, so that Sowerberry, if he come up after us, might poke in his old nose and have us taken back in a cart with handcuffs on,' said Mr. Claypole, in a jeering tone. "'No, I shall go and lose myself among the narrowest streets I can find, and not stop till we come to the very out of the wayest house I can set eyes on. God, you may thanks your stars I've got ahead, for if we hadn't gone at first the wrong road of purpose and come back across the country, you'd have been locked up hard and fast a week ago, my lady, and serve you right for being a fool. I know I ain't as cunning as you are replied Charlotte. "'But don't put all the blame on me, and say I should have been locked up. You would have been, if I had been, anyway.' "'You took the money from the till. You know you did,' said Mr. Claypole. "'I took it for you, Noah, dear,' rejoined Charlotte. "'Did I keep it?' asked Mr. Claypole. "'No. You trusted in me, and let me carry it like a dear, a and so you are,' said the lady chucking him under the chin, and drawing her arm through his. This was indeed the case, but as it was not Mr. Claypole's habit to repose a blind and foolish confidence in anybody, it should be observed, in justice to that gentleman, that he had trusted Charlotte to this extent, in order that, if they were pursued, the money might be found on her, which would leave him an opportunity of asserting his innocence of any theft, and would greatly facilitate his chances of escape. Of course, he entered at this juncture into no explanation of his motives, and they walked on very lovingly together. In pursuance of this cautious plan, Mr. Claypole went on, without halting, until he arrived at the Angel at Islington, where he wisely judged, from the crowd of passengers and numbers of vehicles, that London began in earnest. Just pausing to observe, which appeared the most crowded streets, and consequently the most to be avoided, 
he crossed into St. John's Road, and was soon deep in the obscurity of the intricate and dirty ways which, lying between Gray's Inn Lane and Smithfield, render that part of the town one of the lowest and worst that improvement has left in the midst of London. Through these streets, Noah Claypole walked, dragging Charlotte after him, now stepping into the kennel to embrace at a glance the whole external character of some small public-house, now jogging on again, as some fancied appearance induced him to believe it too public for his purpose. At length he stopped in front of one, more humble in appearance, and more dirty than any he had yet seen, and, having crossed over and surveyed it from the opposite pavement, graciously announced his intention of putting up there for the night. "'So, give us the bundle,' said Noah, unstrapping it from the woman's shoulders, and slinging it over his own, "'and don't you speak, except when you're spoke to. What's the name of the house? Three—what? Cripples,' said Charlotte. Three cripples,' repeated Noah, "'and a very good sign, too. Now, then, keep close at my heels, and come along.' With these injunctions he pushed the rattling door with his shoulder, and entered the house, followed by his companion. There was nobody in the bar but a young Jew, who, with his two elbows on the counter, was reading a dirty newspaper. He stared very hard at Noah, and Noah stared very hard at him. If Noah had been attired in his charity boy's dress, there might have been some reason for the Jew opening his eyes so wide. But as he had discarded the coat and badge, and wore a short smock-frock over his leathers, there seemed no particular reason for his appearance exciting so much attention in a public house. "'Is this the three cripples?' asked Noah. "'Dat is the dabe of this house,' replied the Jew. "'A gentleman we met on the road, coming up from the country, recommended us here,' said Noah, nudging Charlotte, perhaps to call her attention to this most ingenious device for attracting respect, and perhaps to warn her to betray no surprise. "'We want to sleep here to-night.' "'I be dot certed you cad,' said Barney, who was the attendant sprite. "'But I'll inquire. "'Show us the tap, and give us a bit of cold meat and a drop of beer while you're inquiring, will you?' said Noah. Barney complied, by ushering them into a small back room, and setting the required viands before them. Having done which, he informed the travellers that they could be lodged that night, and left the amiable couple to their refreshment. Now, this back room was immediately behind the bar, and some steps lower, so that any person connected with the house, undrawing a small curtain, which concealed a single pane of glass fixed in the wall of the last-named apartment, about five feet from its flooring, could not only look down upon any guests in the back room, without any great hazard of being observed, the glass being in a dark angle of the wall, between which, and a large upright beam, the observer had to thrust himself but could, by applying his ear to the partition, ascertain with tolerable distinctness their subject of conversation. The landlord of the house had not withdrawn his eye from this place of espial for five minutes, and Barney had only just returned from making the communication above related, when Fagin, in the course of his evening's business, came into the bar to inquire after some of his young pupils. "'Hush!' said Barney. "'Strategist!' in the next room. "'Strangers?' repeated the old man in a whisper. "'Ah! And Robins, too,' added Barney. "'From the country. But something in your way, or I'm mistaken.' Fagin appeared to receive this communication with great interest. Mounting a stool, he cautiously applied his eye to the pane of glass from which secret post he could see Mr. Claypole, taking cold beef from the dish, and porter from the pot, and administering homeopathic doses of both to Charlotte, who sat patiently by, eating and drinking at his pleasure. "'Aha!' he whispered, looking round to Barney. "'I like that fellow's looks. He'd be of use to us. He knows how to train the girl already.' Don't make as much noise as a mouse, my dear, and let me hear him talk. Let me hear him." He again applied his eye to the glass, and turning his ear to the partition, listened attentively, with a subtle and eager look upon his face, that might have appertained to some old goblin. 
"'So I mean to be a gentleman,' said Mr. Claypole, kicking out his legs, and continuing a conversation, the commencement of which Fagin had arrived too late to hear. "'No more jolly old coffins, Charlotte, but a gentleman's life for me, and if you like, you shall be a lady.' "'I should like that well enough, dear,' replied Charlotte. "'A tilt ain't to be emptied every day, and people to get clear off after it.' "'Tills be blowed,' said Mr. Claypole. "'There's more things besides tills to be emptied.' "'What do you mean?' asked his companion. "'Pockets, women's ridicules, houses, mail-coaches, banks,' said Mr. Claypole, rising with the porter. "'But you can't do all that, dear,' said Charlotte. "'I shall look out to get into company with them as can,' replied Noah. They'll be able to make us useful some way or another. Why, you yourself are worth fifty women. I never see such a preciously sly and deceitful creature as you can be when I let you." "'Law! How nice it is to hear you say so!' exclaimed Charlotte, imprinting a kiss upon his ugly face. "'There, that'll do. Don't you be too affectionate, in case I'm cross with you,' said Noah, disengaging himself with great gravity. "'I should like to be the captain of some band.' and have the whopping of them, and following them about, unbeknown to themselves. That would suit me, if there was good profit. And if we could only get in with some gentlemen of this sort, I say it would be cheap at that twenty-pound note you've got, especially as we don't very well know how to get rid of it ourselves." After expressing this opinion, Mr. Claypole looked into the porter-pot with an aspect of deep wisdom, and having well shaken its contents, nodded condescendingly to Charlotte and took a draught, wherewith he appeared greatly refreshed. He was meditating another, when the sudden opening of the door, and the appearance of a stranger, interrupted him. The stranger was Mr. Fagin, and very amiable he looked, and a very low bow he made as he advanced, and setting himself down at the nearest table, ordered something to drink of the grinning Barney. "'A pleasant night, sir, but cool for the time of year said Fagin, rubbing his hands. "'From the country, I see, sir.' "'How do you see that?' asked Noah Claypole. "'We have not so much dust as that in London,' replied Fagin, pointing from Noah's shoes to those of his companion, and from them to the two bundles. "'You're a sharp feller," said Noah. <laughs> "'Only hear that, Charlotte.' "'Why?' "'One need be sharp in this town, my dear,' replied the Jew, sinking his voice to a confidential whisper, "'and that's the truth.' Fagin followed up this remark by striking the side of his nose with his right forefinger, a gesture which Noah attempted to imitate, though not with complete success, in consequence of his own nose not being large enough for the purpose. However, Mr. Fagin seemed to interpret the endeavour as expressing a perfect coincidence with his opinion, and put about the liquor which Barney reappeared with in a very friendly manner. "'Good stuff, that,' observed Mr. Claypole, smacking his lips. "'Dear,' said Fagin, "'a man need be always emptying a till, or a pocket, or a woman's reticule, or a house, or a mail-coach, or a bank, if he drinks it regularly.' Mr. Claypole no sooner heard this extract from his own remarks than he fell back in his chair, and looked from the Jew to Charlotte with a countenance of ashy paleness and excessive terror. "'Don't mind me, my dear,' said Fagin, drawing his chair closer. <laughs> "'It was lucky it was only me that heard you by chance. It was very lucky it was only me.' "'I didn't take it stammered Noah, no longer stretching out his legs like an independent gentleman, but coiling them up as well as he could under his chair. "'He was all her doing. You have got it now, Charlotte. You know you have.' "'No matter who's got it, or who did it, my dear,' replied Fagin, glancing nevertheless with the hawk's eye at the girl and the two bundles. "'I'm in that way myself, and I like you for it.' "'In what way?' asked Mr. Claypole, a little recovering. "'In that way of business,' rejoined Fagin. "'And so are the people of the house. 
you've hit the right nail upon the head, and are as safe here as you could be. There's not a safer place in all this town than is the cripples. That is, when I like to make it so. And I have taken a fancy to you and the young woman, so I've said the word, and you may make your minds easy." Noah Claypole's mind might have been at ease after this assurance, but his body certainly was not, for he shuffled and writhed about into various uncouth positions, eyeing his new friend, meanwhile, with mingled fear and suspicion. "'I'll tell you more,' said Fagin, after he had reassured the girl by dint of friendly nods and muttered encouragements. "'I have got a friend that I think can gratify your darling wish, and put you in the right way, where you can take whatever department of the business you think will suit you best at first, and be taught all the others.' "'You speak as if you were in earnest,' replied Noah. "'What advantage would it be to me to be anything else?' inquired Fagin, shrugging his shoulders. "'Here, let me have a word with you outside.' "'There's no occasion to trouble ourselves to move,' said Noah, getting his legs by gradual degrees abroad again. "'She'll take the luggage upstairs the while. Charlotte, see to them bundles.' This mandate— which had been delivered with great majesty, was obeyed without the slightest demur, and Charlotte made the best of her way off with the packages, while Noah held the door open and watched her out. "'She's kept tolerably well under, ain't she?' he asked as he resumed his seat, in the tone of a keeper who had tamed some wild animal. "'Quite perfect,' rejoined Fagin, clapping him on the shoulder. "'You're a genius, my dear.' "'Why, I suppose if I wasn't, I shouldn't be here,' replied Noah. "'But I say, she'll be back if you lose time.' "'Now, what do you think?' said Fagin. "'If you was to like my friend, could you do better than join him?' "'Is he in a good way of business? That's where it is,' responded Noah, winking one of his little eyes. "'The top of the tree!' employs a power of hands, as the very best society in the profession. "'Regular town-maiders?' asked Mr. Claypole. "'Not a countryman among them. And I don't think he'd take you, even on my recommendation, if he didn't run rather short of assistance just now,' replied Fagin. "'Should I have to hand over?' said Noah, slapping his breeches pocket. "'It couldn't possibly be done without,' replied Fagin, in a most decided manner. Twenty pound, though. It's a lot of money.' "'Not when it's in a note you can't get rid of,' retorted Fagin. "'Number and date taken, I suppose. Payment stopped at the bank. Ah! It's not worth much to him. It'll have to go abroad, and he couldn't sell it for a great deal in the market.' "'When could I see him?' asked Noah, doubtfully. "'Tomorrow morning.' "'Where?' "'Here.' "Hm," said Noah. "'What's the wages?' "'Live like a gentleman. Board and lodging, pipes and spirits free, half of all you earn, and half of all the young woman earns,' replied Mr. Fagin. Whether Noah Claypole, whose rapacity was none of the least comprehensive, would have acceded even to these glowing terms, had he been a perfectly free agent, is very doubtful. But as he recollected that, in the event of his refusal, it was in the power of his new acquaintance to give him up to justice immediately, and more unlikely things had come to pass, he gradually relented, and said he thought that would suit him. "'But you see,' observed Noah, "'as she will be able to do a good deal, I should like to take something very light.' "'A little fancy work?' suggested Fagin. "'Ah, something of that sort,' replied Noah. "'What you think would suit me now? Something not too trying for the strength, and not very dangerous, you know? That's the sort of thing.' "'I heard you talk of something in the spy way upon the others, my dear,' said Fagin. "'My friend wants somebody who would do that well, very much.' "'Why?' "'I did mention that, 
and I shouldn't mind turning my hand to it sometimes, rejoined Mr. Claypole slowly, but it wouldn't pay by itself, you know. That's true, observed the Jew, ruminating, or pretending to ruminate. No, it might not. What do you think, then? asked Noah, anxiously regarding him. Something in the sneaking way, where it was pretty sure work, and not much more risk than being at home. "'What do you think of the old ladies?' asked Fagin. "'There's a good deal of money made in snatching their bags and parcels, and running round the corner.' "'Don't they holler out a good deal, and scratch sometimes?' asked Noah, shaking his head. "'I don't think that would answer my purpose. Ain't there any other line open?' "'Stop,' said Fagin, laying his hand on Noah's knee. "'The kinchin lay.' "'What's that?' demanded Mr. Claypole. "'The Kinchins, my dear,' said Fagin, "'is the young children that's sent on errands by their mothers, "'with sixpences and shillings, "'and the lay is just to take their money away. "'They've always got it ready in their hands. "'Then knock him into the kennel, "'and walk off very slow, "'as if there were nothing else the matter "'but a child fallen down and hurt itself. "'Ha, <laughs> <laughs> roared Mr. Claypole, "'kicking up his legs in an ecstasy. "'Lord, that's the very thing!' "'To be sure it is,' replied Fagin. "'and you can have a few good beats chalked out in Camden Town, "'and Battle Bridge, and neighbourhoods like that, "'where they're always going errands, "'and you can upset as many kinchins as you want, "'any hour in the day!' <laughs> With this, Fagin poked Mr. Claypole in the side, and they joined in a burst of laughter, both long and loud. "'Well, "'That's all right,' said Noah, when he had recovered himself, and Charlotte had returned. "'What time to-morrow shall we say?' "'Will ten do?' asked Fagin, adding, as Mr. Claypole nodded assent, "'What name shall I tell my good friend?' "'Mr. Bolter,' replied Noah, who had prepared himself for such emergency. "'Mr. Maurice Bolter. This is Mrs. Bolter.' "'Mrs. Bolter's—' "'Humble servant,' said Fagin, bowing with grotesque politeness. "'I hope I shall know her better very shortly.' "'Do you hear the gentleman, Charlotte?' thundered Mr. Claypole. "'Yes, Noah, dear,' replied Mrs. Bolter, extending her hand. "'She calls me Noah as a sort of fond way of talking,' said Mr. Morris Bolter, late Claypole, turning to Fagin. Uh, "'You understand?' "'Oh, yes.' "'I understand perfectly,' replied Fagin, telling the truth for once. "'Good night, good night.' With many adieus and good wishes, Mr. Fagin went his way. Noah Claypole, bespeaking his good lady's attention, proceeded to enlighten her relative to the arrangement he had made, with all that haughtiness and air of superiority becoming not only a member of the sterner sex, but a gentleman who appreciated the dignity of a special appointment on the Kinchin Lay in London and its vicinity. End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of Oliver Twist The Chapter 43 wherein is shown how the artful dodger got into trouble. "'And so it was you that was your own friend, was it?' asked Mr. Claypole, otherwise Bolter, when, by virtue of the compact entered into between them, he had removed next day to Fagin's house. "'Cod! I thought as much last night!' "'Every man's his own friend, my dear,' replied Fagin, with his most insinuating grin. "'He hasn't as good a one as himself, anywhere.' "'Except sometimes,' replied Morris Bolter, assuming the air of a man of the world. "'Some people are nobody's enemies but their own, you know.' "'Don't believe that,' said Fagin. "'When a man's his own enemy, it's only because he's too much his own friend. 
not because he's careful for everybody but himself. Poo, poo, there ain't such a thing in nature. There oughtn't to be if there is, replied Mr. Bolter. That stands to reason. Some conjurers say that number three is the magic number, and some say number seven. It's neither, my friend, neither. It's number one. Ha, 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 cried Mr. Bolter. Number one forever. In a little community like ours, my dear, said Fagin, who felt it necessary to qualify his position, we have a general number one, without considering me too as the same, and all the other young people. "'Oh, the devil!' exclaimed Mr. Bolter. "'You see,' pursued Fagin, affecting to disregard this interruption, "'we are so mixed up together and identified in our interests that it must be so. For instance, it's your object to take care of number one, meaning yourself.' "'Certainly,' replied Mr. Bolter. "'You're about right there.' "'Well,' You can't take care of yourself, number one, without taking care of me, number one. Number two, you mean, said Bolter, who was largely endowed with the quality of selfishness. No, I don't, retorted Fagin. I'm of the same importance to you as you are to yourself. I say, interrupted Mr. Bolter, you're a very nice man, and I'm very fond of you. But we ain't quite so thick together as all it comes to." "'Only think,' said Fagin, shrugging his shoulders and stretching out his hands, "'only consider. You've done what's a very pretty thing, and what I love you for doing, but what at the same time would put the cravat round your throat, that's so very easily tied, and so very difficult to unloose, in plain English. The altar. Mr. Bolter put his hand to his neckerchief, as if he felt it inconveniently tight, and murmured an assent, qualified in tone, but not in substance. "'The gallows,' continued Fagin, "'the gallows, my dear, is an ugly finger-post, which points out a very short and sharp turning that has stopped many a bold fellow's career on the broad highway to keep in the easy road, and keep it at a distance, is object number one with you." "'Of course it is,' replied Mr. Bolter. "'What do you talk about such things for?' "'Only to show you my meaning clearly,' said the Jew, raising his eyebrows. "'To be able to do that, you depend upon me. To keep my little business all snug, I depend upon you. The first is your number one, the second my number one. The more you value your number one, the more careful you must be of mine. So we come at last to what I told you at first, that a regard for number one holds us all together, and must do so, unless we would all go to pieces in company." "'That's true,' rejoined Mr. Bolter thoughtfully. Oh, you're a cunning old codger!" Mr. Fagin saw with delight that this tribute to his powers was no mere compliment, but that he had really impressed his recruit with a sense of his wily genius, which it was most important that he should entertain in the outset of their acquaintance. To strengthen an impression so desirable and useful, he followed up the blow by acquainting him, in some detail, with the magnitude and extent of his operations blending truth and fiction together, as best served his purpose, and bringing both to bear with so much art that Mr. Bolter's respect visibly increased, and became tempered at the same time with a degree of wholesome fear which it was highly desirable to awaken. "'It's this mutual trust we have in each other that consoles me under heavy losses,' said Fagin. "'My best hand was taken from me yesterday morning.' "'You don't mean to say he died?' cried Mr. Bolter. "'No, no,' replied Fagin. "'Not as bad as that. Not quite so bad.' "'What? I suppose he was—' 
wanted interposed fagin yes he was wanted very particular inquired mr bolter no replied fagin not very he was charged with attempting to pick a pocket and they found a silver snuff-box on him his own my dear his own for he took snuff himself and was very fond of it they remanded him till to-day for they thought they knew the owner ah he was worth fifty boxes and i'd give the price of as many to have him back you should have known the dodger my dear you should have known the dodger well but i shall know him i hope don't you think so said mr bolter i'm doubtful about it replied fagin with a sigh if they don't get any fresh evidence it'll only be a summary conviction and we shall have him back again after six weeks or so but if they do it's a case of lagging they know what a clever lad he is he'll be a lifer they'll make the artful nothing less than a lifer what do you mean by lagging and a lifer demanded mr bolter what's the good of talking in that way to me why don't you speak so as i can understand you fagin was about to translate these mysterious expressions into the vulgar tongue and being interpreted mr bolter would have been informed that they represented that combination of words transportation for life when the dialogue was cut short by the entry of master bates with his hands in his breeches pockets and his face twisted into a look of semi-comical woe it's all up fagin said charley when he and his new companion had been made known to each other what do you mean they found the gentleman as owns the box two or three moors are coming to identify him and the artfuls booked for a passage out replied master bates i must have a full suit of mourning fagin and a hat-band to wizard him in afore he sets out upon his travels to think of jack dawkins lummy jack the dodger the artful dodger going abroad for a common tumpney apney sneeze box i never thought he'd a done it under a gold watch chain and seals at the lowest oh why didn't he rob some rich old gentleman of all his wallables and and, and go out as a gentleman and not like a common prig without no honour nor glory with this expression of feeling for his unfortunate friend master bates sat himself on the nearest chair with an aspect of chagrin and despondency what do you talk about his having neither honour nor glory for exclaimed fagin darting an angry look at his pupil wasn't he always the top sawyer among you all is there one of you that could touch him or come near him on any scent eh not one replied master bates in a voice rendered husky by regret not one and what do you talk of replied fagin angrily what are you blubbering for course it isn't on the wreck ord is it said charley chafed into perfect defiance of his venerable friend by the current of his regrets course it can't come out in the diamond course nobody will never know half of what he was how will he stand in the newgate calendar perhaps not be there at all oh my eye my eye what a blow it is <laughs> cried fagin extending his right hand and turning to mr bolter in a fit of chuckling which shook him as though he had the palsy see what a fry they take in their profession my dear ain't it beautiful mr bolter nodded assent and fagin after contemplating the grief of charley bates for some seconds with evident satisfaction stepped up to that young gentleman and patted him on the shoulder never mind charley said fagin soothingly it'll come out it'll be sure to come out they'll all know what a clever fellow he was he'll show it himself and not disgrace his old pals and teachers think how young he is too what a distinction charley to be lagged at his time of life well it is an honour that is said charley a little consoled he shall have all he wants continued the jew he shall be kept in the stone jug charley like a gentleman like a gentleman 
with his beer every day, and money in his pocket to pitch and toss with, if he can't spend it. No, shall he, though? cried Charlie Bates. Ay, that he shall, replied Fagin. And we'll have a big wig, Charlie, one that's got the greatest gift of the gab, to carry on his defence, and he shall make a speech for himself, too, if he likes, and we'll read it all in the papers. Artful dodger, shrieks of laughter, here the court was convulsed, eh, Charlie, eh? He, <laughs> he, laughed Master Bates. What a lark that would be, wouldn't it, Fagin? I say, how the artful would bother him, wouldn't he? Would, cried Fagin. He shall. He will. Ah, oh, to be sure, so he will, repeated Charlie, rubbing his hands. I think I see him now, cried the Jew, bending his eyes upon his pupil. So do I, cried Charlie Bates. He, 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 so do I. I see it all afore me, upon my soul I do, Fagin. What a game! What a regular game! All the big wigs trying to look solemn, and Jack Dawkins addressing of him as intimate and comfortable as if he was the judge's own son making a speech at a dinner. <laughs> In fact, Mr. Fagin had so well humoured his young friend's eccentric disposition that Master Bates, who had at first been disposed to consider the imprisoned dodger rather in the light of a victim, now looked upon him as the chief actor in a scene of most uncommon and exquisite humour, and felt quite impatient for the arrival of the time when his old companion should have so favourable an opportunity of displaying his abilities. "'We must know how he gets on to-day, by some handy means or other,' said Fagin. "'Let me think. Shall I go?' asked Charlie. "'Not for the world,' replied Fagin. "'Are you mad, my dear? Stark mad, that you'd walk into the very place where—' "'No, Charlie, no. One is enough to lose at a time.' "'You don't mean to go yourself, I suppose?' said Charlie, with a humorous leer. "'That wouldn't quite fit,' replied Fagin, shaking his head. "'Then why don't you send this new cove?' asked Master Bates, laying his hand on Noah's arm. "'Nobody knows him.' "'Why, if he didn't mind,' observed Fagin. "'Mind?' interposed Charlie. "'What should he have to mind?' "'Really nothing, my dear,' said Fagin, turning to Mr. Bolter. "'Really nothing.' "'Oh, I dare say about that, you know,' observed Noah, backing towards the door and shaking his head with a kind of sober alarm. "'No, no, none of that. It's not in my department, that ain't.' "'What department has he got, Fagin?' inquired Master Bates, surveying Noah's lank form with much disgust. "'The cutting away when there's anything wrong, and the eating all the whittles when there's everything right. Is that his branch?' "'Never mind,' retorted Mr. Bolter. "'And don't you take liberties with your superiors, little boy, or you'll find yourself in the wrong shop.' Master Bates laughed so vehemently at this magnificent threat that it was some time before Fagin could interpose, and represent to Mr. Bolter that he incurred no possible danger in visiting the police office, that, inasmuch as no account of the little affair in which he had engaged, nor any description of his person had yet been forwarded to the metropolis, it was very probable that he was not even suspected of having resorted to it for shelter, and that, if he were properly disguised, it would be as safe a spot for him to visit as any in London inasmuch as it would be, of all places, the very last to which he could be supposed likely to resort of his own free will. Persuaded in part by these representations, but overborne in a much greater degree by his fear of Fagin, Mr. Bolter at length consented, with a very bad grace, to undertake the expedition. By Fagin's directions he immediately substituted for his own attire a wagoner's frock, velveteen breeches, and leather leggings, all of which articles the Jew had at hand. He was likewise furnished with a felt hat well garnished with turnpike tickets and a carter's whip. Thus equipped, he was to saunter into the office as some country fellow from Covent Garden Market might be supposed to do for the gratification of his curiosity, 
and as he was as awkward, ungainly, and raw-boned a fellow as need be, Mr. Fagin had no fear but that he would look the part to perfection. These arrangements completed, he was informed of the necessary signs and tokens by which to recognise the artful dodger, and was conveyed by Master Bates through dark and winding ways to within a very short distance of Bow Street. Having described the precise situation of the office, and accompanied it with copious directions how he was to walk straight up the passage, and when he got into the side, and pull off his hat as he went into the room, Charley Bates bade him hurry on alone, and promised to bide his return on the spot of their parting. Noah Claypole, or Morris Bolter, as the reader pleases, punctually followed the directions he had received, which, Master Bates being pretty well acquainted with the locality, was so exact that he was enabled to gain the magisterial presence without asking any question, or meeting with any interruption by the way. He found himself jostled among a crowd of people, chiefly women, who were huddled together in a dirty, frowsy room, at the upper end of which was a raised platform, railed off from the rest, with a dock for the prisoners on the left hand against the wall, a box for the witnesses in the middle, and a desk for the magistrates on the right. The awful locality last named, being screened off by a partition which concealed the bench from the common gaze, and left the vulgar to imagine, if they could, the full majesty of justice. There were only a couple of women in the dock, who were nodding to their admiring friends, while the clerk read some depositions to a couple of policemen, and a man in plain clothes, who leant over the table. A jailer stood reclining against the dock rail, tapping his nose listlessly with a large key, except when he repressed an undue tendency to conversation among the idlers, by proclaiming silence, or looked sternly up to bid some woman, "'Take that baby out!' When the gravity of justice was disturbed by feeble cries, half smothered in the mother's shawl, from some meagre infant. The room smelt close and unwholesome, the walls were dirt discoloured, and the ceiling blackened. There was an old smoky bust over the mantel-shelf, and a dusty clock above the dock the only thing present that seemed to go on as it ought, for depravity, or poverty, or an habitual acquaintance with both, had left a taint on all the animate matter, hardly less unpleasant than the thick, greasy scum on every inanimate object that frowned upon it. Noah looked eagerly about him for the dodger, but although there were several women who would have done very well for that distinguished character's mother or sister, and more than one man who might be supposed to bear a strong resemblance to his father, Nobody at all answering the description given him of Mr. Dawkins was to be seen. He waited in a state of much suspense and uncertainty, until the women, being committed for trial, went flaunting out, and then was quickly relieved by the appearance of another prisoner, who he felt at once could be no other than the object of his visit. It was indeed Mr. Dawkins, who, shuffling into the office with the big coat-sleeves tucked up as usual, his left hand in his pocket, and his hat in his right hand, preceded the jailer with a rolling gait altogether indescribable, and, taking his place in the dock, requested in an audible voice to know what he was placed in that ear disgraceful situation for. "'Hold your tongue, will you?' said the jailer. "'I'm an Englishman, ain't I?' rejoined the dodger. "'Where are my privileges?' "'You'll get your privileges soon enough,' retorted the jailer, "'and pepper with them.' "'We'll see what the Secretary of State for the Home Affairs has got to say to the Beaks, if I don't,' replied Mr. Dawkins. "'Now, then, what is this here business? I shall thank the magistrates to dispose of this here little affair, and not to keep me while they read the paper, for I've got an appointment with a gentleman in the city. And as I am a man of my word, and very punctual in business matters, he'll go away if I ain't there to my time. And then, perhaps, there won't be an action to damages against them as kept me away. Oh, no, certainly not." At this point, the dodger, with a show of being very particular with a view to proceedings to be had thereafter, desired the jailer to communicate the names of them two files as was on the bench, which so tickled the spectators that they laughed almost as heartily as Master Bates could have done if he had heard the request. "'Silence there!' cried the jailer. "'What is this?' inquired one of the magistrates. "'A pickpocket, in case, Your Worship. Has the boy ever been here before?' "'He ought to have been, a many times,' replied the jailer. "'He has been pretty well everywhere else. 
I know him well, your worship. Oh, you know me, do you? cried the artful, making a note of the statement. Very good. That's a case of defamation of character, anyway. Here there was another laugh, and another cry of silence. Now then, where are the witnesses? said the clerk. Ah, oh, that's right, added the dodger. Where are they? I should like to see em. This wish was immediately gratified, for a policeman stepped forward, who had seen the prisoner attempt the pocket of an unknown gentleman in a crowd, and indeed take a handkerchief therefrom, which, being a very old one, he deliberately put it back again, after trying it on his own countenance. For this reason he took the dodger into custody as soon as he could get near him, and the said dodger, being searched, had upon his person a silver snuff-box with the owner's name engraved upon the lid. This gentleman had been discovered on reference to the court guide, and being then and there present, swore that the snuff-box was his, and that he had missed it on the previous day, the moment he had disengaged himself from the crowd before referred to. He had also remarked a young gentleman in the throng, particularly active in making his way about, and that young gentleman was the prisoner before him. "'Have you anything to ask this witness, boy?' said the magistrate. "'I wouldn't abase myself by descending to hold no conversation with him,' replied the dodger. "'Have you anything to say at all?' "'Do you hear his worship ask if you've anything to say?' inquired the jailer, nudging the silent dodger with his elbow. "'I beg your pardon,' said the dodger, looking up with an air of abstraction. "'Did you redress yourself to me, my man?' "'I never see such an out-and-out -out young vagabond, your worship.' observed the officer, with a grin. "'Do you mean to say anything, you young shaver?' "'No,' replied the dodger. "'Not here, for this ain't the shop for justice. Besides which, my attorney is a breakfast in this morning with the vice-president of the House of Commons. But I shall have something to say elsewhere, and so will he, and so will a very numerous and spectable circle of acquaintance, as'll make them beaks wish they'd never been born, or that they got their footmen to hang em up to their own hat-pegs, afore they let em come out this morning to try it on upon me. I'll—' "'There! He's fully committed,' interposed the clerk. "'Take him away.' "'Come on,' said the jailer. "'Oh, ah! I'll come on,' replied the dodger, brushing his hat with the palm of his hand. "'Ah!' to the bench. "'It's no use your looking frightened. I won't show you no mercy, not a haperth of it. You pay for this, my fine fellers. I wouldn't be you for something. I wouldn't go free now, if you was to fall down on your knees and ask me. Here, carry me off to prison. Take me away." With these last words, the dodger suffered himself to be led off by the collar, threatening, till he got into the yard, to make a parliamentary business of it, and then grinning in the officer's face with great glee and self-approval. Having seen him locked up by himself in a little cell, Noah made the best of his way back to where he had left Master Bates. After waiting here some time, he was joined by that young gentleman, who had prudently abstained from showing himself until he had looked carefully abroad from a snug retreat, and ascertained that his new friend had not been followed by any impertinent person. The two hastened back together to bear to Mr. Fagin the animating news that the Dodger was doing full justice to his bringing up, and establishing for himself a glorious reputation. End of chapter 43《Chapter 44 of Oliver Twist • This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Recorded by Mill Nicholson • Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens • Chapter 44 • The time arrives for Nancy to redeem her pledge to Rose Maylie. She fails. Adept as she was in all the arts of cunning and dissimulation, the girl Nancy could not wholly conceal the effect which the knowledge of the step she had taken wrought upon her mind. She remembered that both the crafty Jew and the brutal Sykes had confided to her schemes, which had been hidden from all others, in the full confidence that she was trustworthy and beyond the reach of their suspicion. Vile as those schemes were, desperate as were their originators, and bitter as were her feelings towards Fagin, who had led her, step by step, deeper and deeper, down into an abyss of crime and misery, 
whence was no escape. Still, there were times when, even towards him, she felt some relenting, lest her disclosure should bring him within the iron grasp he had so long eluded, and he should fall at last, richly as he merited such a fate, by her hand. But these were the mere wanderings of a mind unable wholly to detach itself from old companions and associations, though enabled to fix itself steadily on one object, and resolved not to be turned aside by any consideration. Her fears for Sykes would have been more powerful inducements to recoil, while there was yet time, but she had stipulated that her secret should be rigidly kept. She had dropped no clue which could lead to his discovery. She had refused, even for his sake, a refuge from all the guilt and wretchedness that encompasses her. And what more could she do? She was resolved. Though all her mental struggles terminated in this conclusion, they forced themselves upon her again and again, and left their traces too. She grew pale and thin, even within a few days. At times she took no heed of what was passing before her or no part in conversations where once she would have been the loudest. At other times she laughed without merriment, and was noisy without a moment afterwards. She sat silent and dejected, brooding with her head upon her hands, while the very effort by which she roused herself told more forcibly than even these indications that she was ill at ease, and that her thoughts were occupied with matters very different and distant from those in the course of discussion by her companions. It was Sunday night, and the bell of the nearest church struck the hour. Sykes and the Jew were talking, but they paused to listen. The girl looked up from the low seat on which she crouched, and listened too. Eleven. "'An hour this side of midnight,' said Sykes, raising the blind to look out and returning to his seat. "'Dark and heavy it is, too. A good night for business, this.' "'Ah!' replied Fagin. "'What a pity, Bill, my dear, that there's none quite ready to be done.' "'You're right for once,' replied Sykes, gruffly. "'Here's a pity, for I'm in the humour, too.' Fagin sighed and shook his head despondingly. "'We must make up for lost time, when we've got things into a good train. That's all I know,' said Sykes. "'That's the way to talk, my dear.' replied Fagin, venturing to pat him on the shoulder. "'It does me good to hear you.' "'Does you good, does it?' cried Sykes. "'Well, so be it.' <laughs> "'Laughed Fagin, as if he were relieved by even this concession. "'You're like yourself to-night, Bill. Quite like yourself.' "'I don't feel like myself when you lay that withered old claw on my shoulder, so take it away.' said Sykes, casting off the Jew's hand. "'It makes you nervous, Bill. Reminds you of being nabbed, does it?' said Fagin, determined not to be offended. "'Reminds me of being nabbed by the devil,' returned Sykes. "'There never was another man with such a face as yours, unless it was your father, and I suppose he is singeing his grizzled red beard by this time, unless you came straight from the old un, without any father at all betwixt you, which I shouldn't wonder at a bit." Fagin offered no reply to this compliment, but, pulling Sykes by the sleeve, pointed his finger towards Nancy, who had taken advantage of the foregoing conversation to put on her bonnet, and was now leaving the room. Hello, cried Sykes. "'Nance, where's the gal going to at this time of night?' "'Not far. "'What answer's that?' retorted Sykes. "'Do you hear me?' "'I don't know where,' replied the girl. "'Then I do,' said Sykes, more in the spirit of obstinacy than because he had any real objection to the girl going where she listed. "'Nowhere. Sit down.' "'I'm not well. I told you that before,' rejoined the girl. "'I want a breath of air.' "'Put your head out on the window.' replied Sykes. "'There's not enough there,' said the girl. "'I want it in the street.' "'Then you won't have it,' replied Sykes, with which assurance he rose, locked the door, took the key out, and pulled her bonnet from her head, flung it up to the top of an old press. "'There,' said the robber, 
Now stop quietly where you are, will you? It's not such a matter as a bonnet would keep me, said the girl, turning very pale. What do you mean, Bill? Do you know what you're doing? No, what I'm— Oh, cried Sykes, turning to Fagin. She's out of her senses, you know. Or she daren't talk to me in that way. You'll drive me on the something desperate, muttered the girl, placing both hands upon her breast, as though to keep down by force some violent outbreak. Let me go, will you? This minute, this instant. No, said Sykes. Tell him to let me go, Fagin. He had better. It'll be better for him. Do you hear me? cried Nancy, stamping her foot upon the ground. "'Hear you?' repeated Sykes, turning round in his chair to confront her. "'Aye. And if I hear you for half a minute longer, the dog shall have such a grip on your throat as'll tear some of that screaming voice out. What's come over you, you jade? What is it?' "'Let me go,' said the girl with great earnestness. Then, sitting herself down on the floor before the door, she said, "'Bill, let me go.' You don't know what you're doing. You don't, indeed. For only one hour. Do, do. Cut my limbs off one by one, cried Sykes, seizing her roughly by the arm. If I don't think the gal's stark raving mad, get up. Not till you let me go. Not till you let me go. Never, never, screamed the girl. Sykes looked on for a minute, watching his opportunity and suddenly pinioning her hands, dragged her, struggling and wrestling with him by the way, into a small room adjoining, where he sat himself on a bench, and thrusting her into a chair, held her down by force. She struggled and implored by turns, until twelve o'clock had struck, and then, wearied and exhausted, ceased to contest the point any further. With a caution, backed by many oaths, to make no more efforts to go out that night, Sykes left her to recover at leisure and rejoined Fagin. "'Phew!' said the housebreaker, wiping the perspiration from his face. "'What a precious strange girl that is!' "'You may say that, Bill,' replied Fagin thoughtfully. "'You may say that. What did she take it into her head to go out to-night for, do you think?' asked Sykes. "'Come, you should know her better than me. What does it mean?' "'Obstinacy.' "'Woman's obstinacy, I suppose, my dear. "'Well, I suppose it is,' growled Sykes. "'I thought I had tamed her, but she's as bad as ever.' "'Worse,' said Fagin thoughtfully. "'I never knew her like this for such a little cause.' "'Nor I,' said Sykes. "'I think she's got a touch of that fever in her blood yet, "'and it won't come out, eh?' "'Like enough.' I'll let her a little blood, without troubling the doctor, if she's took that way again," said Sykes. Fagin nodded an expressive approval of this mode of treatment. "'She was hanging about me all day and night, too, when I was stretched on me back. And you, like a black-hearted wolf as you are, kept yourself aloof,' said Sykes. "'We was poor, too, all the time. And I think, one way or other, it's worried and fretted her and that being shut up here so long has made her restless, eh?" "'That's it, my dear,' replied the Jew in a whisper. "'Hush!' As he uttered these words, the girl herself appeared and resumed her former seat. Her eyes were swollen and red. She rocked herself to and fro, tossed her head, and after a little time burst out laughing. "'Why, now she's on the other tack!' exclaimed Sykes turning a look of excessive surprise on his companion. Fagin nodded to him, to take no further notice just then, and, in a few minutes, the girl subsided into her accustomed demeanour. Whispering Sykes that there was no fear of her relapsing, Fagin took up his hat, and bade him good-night. He paused when he reached the room door, and, looking round, asked if somebody would light him down the dark stairs. "'Light him down?' said Sykes, who was filling his pipe. "'It's a pity he should break his neck himself, and disappoint the sightseers. Show him a light.' Nancy followed the old man downstairs with a candle. When they reached the passage, he laid his finger on his lip, 
and drawing close to the girl, said in a whisper, "'What is it, Nancy, dear?' "'What do you mean?' replied the girl in the same tone. "'The reason of all this,' replied Fagin, "'if he—he pointed with his skinny forefinger up the stairs—is so hard with you, he's a brute, Nancy, a brute beast. Why don't you—' "'Well,' said the girl, as Fagin paused, with his mouth almost touching her ear, and his eyes looking into hers, "'No matter just now. We'll talk of this again. You have a friend in me, Nance, a staunch friend. I have the means at hand, quiet and close. If you want revenge on those that treat you like a dog, like a dog, worse than his dog, for he humours him sometimes, come to me. I say, come to me. He is the mere hound of a day, but you know me of old Nance." "'I know you well,' replied the girl, without manifesting the least emotion. "'Good night.' She shrank back, as Fagin offered to lay his hand on hers, but said good night again, in a steady voice, and answering his parting look with a nod of intelligence, closed the door between them. Fagin walked towards his home intent upon the thoughts that were working within his brain. He had conceived the idea, not from what had just passed, though that had tended to confirm him, but slowly and by degrees, that Nancy, wearied of the housebreaker's brutality, had conceived an attachment for some new friend. Her altered manner, her repeated absences from home alone, her comparative indifference to the interests of the gang, of which she had once been so zealous, and added to these her desperate impatience to leave home that night at a particular hour, all favoured the supposition, and rendered it to him, at least, almost matter of certainty. The object of this new liking was not among his myrmidons. He would be a valuable acquisition with such an assistant as Nancy, and must, thus Fagin argued, be secured without delay. There was another and a darker object to be gained. Sykes knew too much, and his ruffian taunts had not galled Fagin the less, because the wounds were hidden. The girl must know well that if she shook him off she could never be safe from his fury, and that it would be surely wreaked to the maiming of limbs, or perhaps the loss of life, on the object of her more recent fancy. With a little persuasion, thought Fagin, what more likely than that she would consent to poison him? Women have done such things, and worse, to secure the same object before now. There would be the dangerous villain, the man I hate, gone, another secured in his place, and my influence over the girl, with the knowledge of this crime to back it, unlimited. These things passed through the mind of Fagin, during the short time he sat alone in the housebreaker's room, and, with them uppermost in his thoughts, he had taken the opportunity afterwards afforded him of sounding the girl in the broken hints he threw out at parting. There was no expression of surprise, no assumption of an inability to understand his meaning. The girl clearly comprehended it. Her glance at parting showed that. But perhaps she would recoil from a plot to take the life of Sykes, and that was one of the chief ends to be attained. How, thought Fagin, as he crept homeward, can I increase my influence with her? What new power can I acquire? Such brains are fertile in expedients. If, without extracting a confession from herself, he laid a watch, discovered the object of her altered regard, and threatened to reveal the whole history to Sykes, of whom she stood in no common fear, unless she entered into his designs, could he not secure her compliance? "'I can,' said Fagin, almost aloud. "'She durst not refuse me, then. Not for her life, not for her life. I have it all. The means are ready, and shall be set to work. I shall have you yet.' He cast back a dark look, and a threatening motion of the hand, towards the spot where he had left the bolder villain, and went on his way busying his bony hands in the folds of his tattered garment, which he wrenched tightly in his grasp, 
as though there were a hated enemy crushed with every motion of his fingers. End of chapter 44《Chapter Forty Five of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Five. Noah Claypole is employed by Fagin on a secret mission. The old man was up betimes next morning, and waited impatiently for the appearance of his new associate, who, after a delay that seemed interminable, at length presented himself, and commenced a voracious assault on the breakfast. "'Bolter,' said Fagin, drawing up a chair, and seating himself opposite Morris Bolter. "'Well, here I am,' returned Noah. "'What's the matter? Don't you ask me to do anything till I've done eating. That's a great fault in this place. You never get time enough over your meals.' "'You can talk as you eat, can't you?' said Fagin cursing his dear young friend's greediness from the very bottom of his heart. "'Oh, yes, I can talk. I get on better when I talk,' said Noah, cutting a monstrous slice of bread. "'Where's Charlotte?' "'Out,' said Fagin. "'I sent her out this morning with the other young woman, because I wanted us to be alone.' "'Oh,' said Noah, "'I wish you'd order her to make some buttered toast first. Well, talk away.' You won't interrupt me." There seemed indeed no great fear of anything interrupting him, as he had evidently sat down with a determination to do a great deal of business. "'You did well yesterday, my dear,' said Fagin. "'Beautiful! Six shillings and ninepence halfpenny on the very first day. The kinchin lay will be a fortune to you.' "'Don't you forget to add three pint pots and a milk can said Mr. Bolter. "'No, no, my dear. The pint-pots were great strokes of genius, but the milk-can was a perfect masterpiece.' "'Pretty well, I think, for a beginner,' remarked Mr. Bolter, complacently. "'The pots I took off airy railings, and the milk-can was standing by itself outside a public-house. I thought it might get rusty with the rain, or catch cold, you know, eh?' <laughs> Fagin affected to laugh very heartily, and Mr. Bolter, having had his laugh out, took a series of large bites, which finished his first hunk of bread and butter, and assisted himself to a second. "'I want you, Bolter,' said Fagin, leaning over the table, "'to do a piece of work for me, my dear, that needs great care and caution.' "'I say,' rejoined Bolter, "'don't you go shoving me into danger or sending me any more of your police offices. That don't suit me, that don't, and so I tell you. That's not the smallest danger in it, not the very smallest," said the Jew. It's only to dodge a woman. An old woman? demanded Mr. Bolter. A young one, replied Fagin. I can do that pretty well, I know, said Bolter. I was a regular cunning sneak when I was at school. What am I to dodge her for? not to not to do anything but to tell me where she goes who she sees and if possible what she says to remember the street if it is a street or the house if it is a house and to bring me back all the information you can what'll you give me asked noah setting down his cup and looking his employer eagerly in the face if you do it well a pound my dear one pound said fagin wishing to interest him in the scent as much as possible and that's what i never gave yet for any job of work where there wasn't valuable consideration to be gained who is she inquired noah one of us oh law cried noah curling up his nose you're doubtful of her are you she has found out some new friends my dear and i must know who they are replied fagin i see said noah just to have the pleasure of knowing them if they're respectable people eh <laughs> i'm your man i knew you would be cried fagin elated by the success of his proposal of course of course 
replied Noah. "'Where is she? Where am I to wait for her? Where am I to go?' "'All that, my dear, you shall hear from me. I'll point her out at the proper time,' said Fagin. "'You keep ready, and leave the rest to me.' That night, and the next, and the next again, the spy sat booted and equipped in his carter's dress, ready to turn out at a word from Fagin. Six nights passed, six long, weary nights, and on each Fagin came home with a disappointed face, and briefly intimated that it was not yet time. On the seventh he returned earlier, and with an exultation he could not conceal. It was Sunday. "'She goes abroad to-night,' said Fagin, "'and on the right errand, I'm sure, for she has been alone all day, and the man she is afraid of will not be back much before daybreak. Come with me, quick!' Noah started up without saying a word, for the Jew was in a state of such intense excitement that it infected him. They left the house stealthily, and hurrying through a labyrinth of streets, arrived at length before a public house, which Noah recognised as the same in which he had slept on the night of his arrival in London. It was past eleven o'clock, and the door was closed. It opened softly on its hinges as Fagin gave a low whistle. They entered, without noise, and the door was closed behind them. Scarcely venturing to whisper, but substituting dumb show for words, Fagin, and the young Jew who had admitted them, pointed out the pane of glass to Noah, and signed to him to climb up and observe the person in the adjoining room. "'Is that the woman?' he asked, scarcely above his breath. Fagin nodded yes. "'I can't see her face well,' whispered Noah. "'She is looking down, and a candle is behind her.' "'Stay there,' whispered Fagin. He signed to Barney, who withdrew. In an instant the lad entered the room adjoining, and, under pretence of snuffing the candle, moved it in the required position, and, speaking to the girl, caused her to raise her face. "'I see her now,' cried the spy. "'Plainly. I should know her among a thousand. He hastily descended as the room door opened and the girl came out. Fagin drew him behind a small partition which was curtained off, and they held their breaths as she passed within a few feet of their place of concealment, and emerged by the door at which they had entered. "'Hist!' cried the lad who held the door. "'Dow!' Noah exchanged a look with Fagin and darted out. "'To the left,' whispered the lad. "'Take the left hand, and keep on the other side.' He did so, and by the light of the lamps saw the girl's retreating figure already at some distance before him. He advanced as near as he considered prudent, and kept on the opposite side of the street, the better to observe her motions. She looked nervously round twice or thrice, and once stopped to let two men who were following close behind her pass on. She seemed to gather courage as she advanced, and to walk with a steadier and firmer step. The spy preserved the same relative distance between them, and followed, with his eye upon her. End of chapter 45